time. And we appreciate you being here. The, we're gonna to try to keep it to an hour tonight, but the topic is uh, investing in real estate, particularly in New Hampshire, but we'll cover uh, more generically some, some topics that can apply anywhere you are or any, um, any different markets. Some of our panelists tonight are out of state. Amy is a co-host with us, is in, Colorado, is in uh, Ohio. Frank is on, um, he lives in New York, but has invested in New Hampshire. So first of all, uh, we'll introduce ourselves as the panelists. My name is Mark Warden. I'm the broker and founder of Porcupine Real Estate. And we've been selling real estate here in New Hampshire to liberty-minded folks and free state project movers the last 13 years. Uh, it's great, we love helping people invest in, in New Hampshire, uh, put roots down here and expand uh, our mission of liberty in our lifetime. We, prior to moving to New Hampshire from Las Vegas, I mean, yeah, I lived in, in Vegas for 10 years and did real estate out there. I've owned rental real estate in New Hampshire, in Nevada, California, and one in Arizona. Owned about 14 properties over the years, personal residences and investment properties. And now I'm down to uh, just one. <laughs> I just sold my last investment property. So I live in my house in Manchester, but I'm, I'm looking to acquire if I find the right one. So I have uh, all some of the same questions you guys have tonight. Let's see. We'll uh, introduce the panelists in just a second, but sort of high level view. Right now, people are always asking us, is it a good time to invest? And the question is, it depends. You know, it feels like we're in a bubble right now with real estate prices almost everywhere. There are some flat or level markets around the country, but it seems like everywhere else, we're looking at bidding wars, people paying, paying over asking price. Uh, it's, it seems ridiculous. Question is, you know, how long will it last? Um, so, I think when you're analyzing real estate and maybe some of the other panelists can speak to this, I think right now you need to really look at uh, the income it produces instead of just planning on appreciation. You know, if you time it right, you can expect to get some appreciation in real estate, but at this point, I wouldn't expect it to do any better than basically keeping up with inflation over time. So you wanna look at uh, the income streams. And then uh, on this bullet point list, we also see appreciation. That's going to help your, your cash flow. All right, if you're investing for cash flow, keep in mind that besides the net income of a property, assuming you have earnings from an, another job or um, some other gainful employment, then you get a, a tax deduction through depreciation. And depreciation on your income property can go against uh, your earnings from your day job. It's very, very powerful. And that is going to really help your uh, cash flow. We're always supposed to say as realtors that we are not tax professionals. So please consult with your own CPA. But if some of the other panelists want to speak to this in a minute, uh, we can. And then we'll talk mostly about New Hampshire real estate. For the first time since I've been here in Constance, I've been here, we're seeing a rush to buy real estate in the northern part of the state, up in what's called Coas County. Towns like Berlin, Lancaster, Littleton, even Grafton. Some of these places uh, for a long time. Uh, just uh, invited Chris into the room. A lot of these places up in the North Country were hit hard by unemployment and they, they really lag the rest of the, uh, the state in regards to prices, price appreciation, and frankly, having tenants. So they weren't good places to invest. But now with a lot of people being able to work from home, as long as you have high-speed internet, we're seeing people move out of the big cities, especially with all the COVID lockdowns and all the scares, the health scares. People want to get the hell out of New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, around here, closer to home, Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts. And they're moving up to these rural areas. And so these rural areas now are doing pretty well uh, in the real estate market. 
we're seeing rents go up, we're seeing higher occupancy rates. So that's something to look at as well. In regards to buying real estate, one of the benefits of it is leverage. So what that means is you have a down payment and you're buying something for a lot of money, but it doesn't cost you a lot of money out of pocket. And we'll have Chris, the lender, on the line with us, and he'll be talking about that in a few minutes. But typically, you're going to put 20, 25% down, for example, on, an, on the purchase. So if you're buying a $400,000 asset and you have to put $100,000 down, well, that's called leverage. And when that really makes a big difference is down the road when you go to sell. And we're going to use a very simple um, example here. Let's say you have buy a property, a multifamily property for 400,000 and it goes up to uh, 440,000, uh, 10% increase. Then you sell it, right? And there are capital gains taxes and other factors to consider. But in general, it's gone up to 10%. On the value, but if you only put hundred thousand dollars down, and it went up forty thousand. Well, that's forty percent return on your money, not just a ten percent return. So that's the value of leverage. Okay, I'm going to stop share now, and um, we're going to introduce our other panelists. We'll start with Constance, who's the associate broker here at Porcupine Real Estate. Give us a little bit of your background, Constance, what you're looking at these days, and then uh, Frank, and then Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Constance. Um, I, as Mark said, associate broker. I've been an agent with Porcupine Real Estate since 2015. And before that, I was an accountant for real estate investors and a real estate investor myself in Alaska. Um, kind of acts accidental landlord at first. I rented out my house when I moved to Alaska and then um, and then stumbled onto uh, Robert Kiyosaki and cash flow and, and such readings when I was um, a young mom. So I've been interested in, in passive income through real estate ever since and uh, had actually purchased a fourplex in Alaska that gave me a three bedroom, two bath apartment. Um, and my tenants covered all the, the mortgage and utilities. And then I sold that for appreciation or my ex-husband and I did. And uh, so when, uh, when I moved to New Hampshire, that was my goal to buy another property. It took me a number of years being self-employed and part-time uh, bookkeeper to do it. But I bought in 2018, I bought a three unit that um, as of August 1st, I'll have fully rented and making quite a bit of cash flow um, plus appreciation. And then I helped my, my boyfriend buy the one that I'm living in now, um, which is a four unit, which also pays for itself. It gives me a, a, nice, a nice upgrade of the uh, apartment that I lived in in my building. Um, and I'm a very busy realtor this year uh, with lots of people moving to New Hampshire. And I'm pretty much at the point where I'm going to look for building number three. I've started looking um, and Chris, who's on the call, can, can talk a little bit about the, uh, the, 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 the struggles from like your owner occupied. It's a lot less money to save up than it is when, when you're going straight investment loans. So I'm at that point that Chris and I are gonna have serious conversations about <laughs> how ready I am for the next building. So, um, for me, I'm mostly cash flow investor. Um, Appreciation is great, and I love looking at Zillow and it telling me how much my building is worth. And yes, as, even as a realtor, I look at the Zillow estimates like uh, we all do. Um, and but that's not, you know, I mean, I do get, I do get the random calls from people saying, "Hey, do you want to sell?" Um, because the market's so hot here in Manchester for for multifamilies. Um, but I have no intention of selling if my tenants are going to pay that off for me and fund my retirement. So um, I really like to encourage first time home buyers before they buy their primary residence to consider even a duplex as a, as a first step if they're ever going to think about being a real estate investor. 
because of the, the financing piece that Chris can talk about. So that's who I am, Hi everyone. Thank, thank you, Constance, very much. Uh, Frank, why don't you give us a little bit about what you've been doing in real estate and where you live, and then after that, we'll hear from Chris. All right. I'm Frank. Uh, I live in New York City. I found out about the Free Stage Project in 2013, met with Mark, and um, started investing in 2016. Uh, currently, my wife and I own New Shire Properties, which is uh, 20 doors all together and currently looking for another building. The market's quite different now, so it's taking a little more time getting my deposit together. Um, I, th there's quite a bit of difference investing in New York compared to New Hampshire, so it was definitely worth it, even being four hours away, using my money to invest in properties there and also being able to hire like-minded people, uh, people who are in interested in the free state project. So it's twofold for me. One is helping people who are interested in the free state project and also uh, the cash flow and saving up for retirement. That's great. Thank you, Frank. I think we're gonna, we'll circle back in a few minutes to talk about property management. And of course, we'd love to hear your experience with that as well as Constance's who manages her, her own. And I see Jeff Day on the line. He has six, five, 11, eight, nine or 10 or 11 years, something. I think he and his wife manage it themselves. So we'll hear some different perspectives. Uh, in the meantime, Chris, welcome. Tell us about uh, who you are. And also let's dig into financing from two to four units and, or actually one to four units and whether uh, it makes a difference if you're gonna live in it what, you know, how much down payment is and all that stuff. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris uh, Nato. I, as of Friday, work for Lakeview Mortgage. I've been in the lending industry for 20 years, uh, but I just made the switch to go work for my old boss. Uh, and it's just him and I at the company. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's going to be very nice and streamlined. As far as investment properties go, Except for a single family, it's all 25% down. So investment basically means you're not living in it. Uh, as Constance was saying, if you can buy your first property uh, and live in it as owner occupied, you can do it through FHA at only three and a half percent down. Um, with the three and four families, there's some other indicators that have to come in that I can go into with you more on a one-on-one -on -one basis, just so I don't complicate things right now. Uh, but buying a owner occupied at three and a half percent down is obviously a lot less money than conventional financing at 25% down. You can do 20% down on a single family. Um, the rate would be even higher than it would if it was a 25% down, but that is always an option too. Um, on this, I do best answering people's questions so I know exactly what to talk about because I could talk forever and it could be nothing that you're interested in. So please, <laughs> what are your questions? That's great. Hey, you guys, please uh, put some questions in the chat box and we can certainly pepper you, Chris, with some of the most common questions we hear. And for those of you on the call, note that if you're looking at a build a multifamily building with five or more Unit. That's a whole different type of financing. It's it's different than your typical home um, mortgage conforming VA FHA conventional mortgages that we hear about all the time, which is what Chris does. I mean, it's not it's all of his business is one to four units. If you uh, are looking at a bigger building, then you always have to put at least twenty or twenty five percent down. And the underwriting guidelines are much different. The rates are higher. And you don't go to a, a mortgage bank or you go to a local bank. Uh, Frank Yaffeldon, who was on the call with us, has had some experience with that. And um, we can go into it more if any of you has, wants to know more. Um, in the meantime, Chris, uh, Constance has done what's called a house hack. So if you're going to live in the house, 
let's say it's a, let's give an example of a three unit building in Manchester. Three unit building and uh, one of the units is vacant and we're, we're an investor. What do you as a lender look for in regards to uh, credit history and job history for somebody to be able to do that? Lending is really the same all across the board, whether you're buying a single family house to live in, a multi-unit to live in, or a multi-unit that you're going to not live in. Uh, it all comes down to your credit history, your income, and your assets. So we're looking for a two-year job history. If you're self-employed, uh, COVID had some increased... I, well, first, is anyone here self-employed? I okay. am. <laughs> so... Uh, Self-employed financing has gotten uh, much more diff much more difficult. There's more stuff involved. COVID basically, you know, they really want to make sure you're making the money. So in addition to the two years of tax returns, we also have to get a profit and loss for the current year and three months of bank statements to prove that the company really is bringing in the amount of money that it says it's bringing in. Uh, and that's how we qualify income. With assets, the only real difference is if you're buying an investment property, you're, you're, anytime you own more than one property, you need to have additional reserves. Reserves is uh, one month of the full mortgage payment, mortgage payment. So the principal and interest, the taxes and insurance. For, to make it easy, basically, you just want to have an additional six months of one, six months of payments in reserve left over after your down payment and your closing costs. And that's for the investment property. Um, as far as offsetting your income, we can use, if you're buying it as an investment property, we can use 75% of the rental income that the property is obtaining. If you're going to live in it, it would just be the units minus the one you're going to live in. Now, if the units are currently leased, we're going to use the lease income. If they are month to month or vacant, we'll use the market rent as determined by the appraiser. Where this comes into play that can really hurt someone is if you've got leases on for the units and the people that have lived there forever and they're paying far below market rent. If they're on true leases, then we have to use those numbers. But if it's just a month to month or they're going to be vacant, then we can use market rent. Amy, can you uh, read us the questions in the chat room? I think Chris can answer these better than uh, I can. Uh, the only question I have is if anybody else on the call has investing experience. I know Jeff Day does, and uh, Robert, if that's Robert Farinelli, then he, uh, he can tell us the ups and downs, pros and cons of owning a, a place in Nashua. I don't know I, about Shane. I think Shana does also. She's the one from down south. I don't know about Steve and Deb. If you guys do, I'll let us know. Um, I guess, Amy, there were some, some in the chat room that came directly to me. One said, Chris, please confirm the details about which properties can qualify for three and a half percent down. So uh, any property that's a one to four unit will qualify for FHA at three and a half percent down. Now, if you're talking about the characteristics of the property, it basically just has to be in good condition. Chipping paint is the thing that trips up everything the most. So there can't be any chipping paint. The roof should look like it's gonna, you know, it's gonna last for another couple of years or so. The heating system should work. The water needs to work. Uh, there really isn't much difference between conventional financing and FHA when it comes to this stuff. Both loans require the house to be safe and habitable. And that basically comes down to having flooring in, you know, no buckle floors or wires hanging out of the wall, that sort of thing but FHA is a little bit stricter than conventional financing is, and FHA is the one at three and a half percent down. Another question in the chat line says, 
can Chris talk about FHA rehab for fixer uppers or for example, making a duplex into a triplex? What, what would that look like? Can that be done with uh, your type of financing? So in theory, yes. Um, but it's a giant pain in the butt. Uh, I won't mislead you. The normal 203K loan is only, only allows you to finance technically up to 35,000 in repairs, but it really turns out to be about 28 or 29,000 because there's gonna be a 10 to 20% contingency that has to be held there. And there's some more fees that also gets on top of that. And the total number can't be over 35,000. So you really can't do too much with, with that. Also that program, the one that everyone thinks about is not for structural repairs. Now FHA does have one for structural repairs where you could add on to the building for what you're saying. That is much more detailed. Uh, you have to have a general contractor do the work. Um, you're basically doing a construction loan in addition to a normal financing loan. So where the hurdles come into play is having the contractors on board, them signing all the documents, getting the town plans involved, getting the engineering plans involved. You have to hire an FHA mediator that uh, coordinates everything between the contractor and you. Uh, they're usually like a grand or so. So as far as trying to turn a two unit into a three or four unit, in my personal opinion, it would be far more, uh, it would, you know, financial sense to just find a three or four unit. Uh, this program is really good if you find that particular house that, you know, the crap house, sorry for my language, but just the not good house in the great neighborhood and you need to expand on it or really bring it up to par. That's, you know, that program is really good for that. Conventional financing also has a rehab program. Uh, it's a little bit less involved. It does allow for structural work, but you would be confined to the much larger down payments on it also. Uh, both programs though, I believe, I have to double check, they're only for owner occupied. They're not for investment purposes. Um, but again, I wouldn't want to double check that because those rules are kind of changing all the time. So if anyone has a specific question or would just like to follow up, you know, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Yeah, when you're looking at these properties, you want to work closely with your agent, like Constance or myself, and the lender. It's a three-way conversation back and forth on every single property because each one has its own story and it may or may not pass regular financing. There is something called hard money lending. And if you're doing flips or uh, uh, total remodel, but that's very expensive short-term financing. What you do is you fix up the house and then eventually you try to get a regular mortgage on it. But again, we have to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations because they can be challenging. A hundred percent. I can't stress that enough. Um, working with us as a team is beyond essential for that because for every home where you have one set of parameters, the next house is literally going to have a different set of parameters on it. And in some cases, hard money, like what Mark's talking about, might be the way to go. Maybe you just do hard money for six months and then once it's done, we do a refinance and you know pay off that lender and you can get some money back. Um, you know, those are options too. But these are things that we can talk about as a group, you know, as a whole, and what will work for one property would not make sense for another property and vice versa. I have a question regarding that, Chris. Can you refinance hard money into FHA owner occupied? Definitely. Yep, because hard money is just another loan. So we would get the payoff from the person that lent you the money when we would pay that off. And as long as you're living in the building, it would just be a refinance. All right, well, let's, uh, we'll continue to look at the chat room for extra questions. But let's talk about um, property management. <laughs> in fact, why don't, so there were some questions in the chat room about this and when we talk about the pros and cons of 
owning an investment property that you don't live in, one of the biggest negatives is always dealing with the tenants. And we have a couple of landlords on the line here. Maybe we can hear from them. Um, Frank, why don't you give us your story, what you've been doing with your buildings in New Hampshire. And then uh, maybe we'll have Jeff Day give us some, some, uh, some uh, scary stories about his experience as well. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Sorry, I think I had it on mute there. Yeah, so I was just saying, uh, I have uh, two properties in downtown Concord and one property in uh, Penacook, which is northern Concord. So I have one property manager for that. And then I have a, a seven unit property that I recently purchased, which is in Franklin, close to the Lakes region. Uh, that was a little too far north for my current property manager. So I hired somebody else. And actually, that's really been to my benefit because I got to see how two different companies uh, solve problems, send me paperwork every month, collect payments. The, um, the property in the Lakes region is in the best condition, so I haven't really had to spend much money as far as rehabilitation and the tenants have pretty much stuck around. Uh, as far as the property manager, they handle all my paperwork. I'm four hours away. So unfortunately, I can only come up a couple of times a year. I have a full-time business that I take care of in New York City. Uh, so they basically, you know, I rely on them to email me any disputes with tenants or tenants moving out. They, um, they deal with pretty much everything. Uh, one of the benefits I have to say is if there's any, any ever, if there's any problems, they'll deal with it in a professional manner. I haven't had any missed payments or had to evict anybody since March. It was March 2020 was a pretty scary time. We didn't know if uh, who was going to go out of business, who wasn't paying, but you know, it turned out everything worked out for the best. We sent letters out to the tenants and having those property managers to mitigate any minor problems, get everybody back on track. And you know, so far I've have a hundred percent occupancy now and everybody's on time. So I think that's definitely uh, one of the positives of having good property management. Hey, Frank, people always want to know how much that costs. Can you give us a rough estimate of how much it takes off uh, the bottom line to hire a property manager versus doing it yourself? Right. So I have a full-time property manager that deals with the Concord area, they charge almost 10%. Uh, with that, they have their own in-house repair crew. So any little problems that come up, they can send their repair crew out and deal with problems. They'll bill me directly. Um, they send me a much more extensive paperwork as, as far as expenses and costs. Uh, my property manager in the Lakes region charges 8%. Um, with that, their services are more limited. They don't have an in-house repair crew, so everything has to be dealt with third party. And, uh, you know, I hold the, uh, the deposits for all the tenants. So it's a little more work for me. Honestly, I deal with this on a daily basis through my construction company, dealing with customers, paperwork. So it's not, it's not that much more work for me to deal with this. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to Jeff Day now, who saves that 10% by managing it himself, unless uh, maybe he pays his wife that 10%. And then Constance, maybe you can share with us your experience as being a, a landlord. I may even need to unmute you, Jeff. Can you do it yourself? Yes, I can. Um, so we've been landlords for 24 years. We started back in 97. We've had a number of single family, two family, three family, and eight unit buildings over the years. Um, and we've also found, and what, what I kind of enjoy is, is um, the creative ways of selling and buying real estate. Um, but to, to the point at hand, it's, it's a matter of, we, we handle our property management ourselves. We, we always have, I, I think I, I can see in the, 
in within a few years to not want to do all that ourselves, that it'd be easier to have somebody who's like 30 something with better knees to go and do that. But I, one thing I like about it is I, I like meeting the people we're going to rent to. So there's an advantage to like, like reading the person's character if they would be good or bad. Um, some to, to speak to what Frank just mentioned about, about evictions, we had a, a, bad, um, a bad tenant that we, that stopped paying us rent at the end of last year, um, um, would not fill out the CAP application to get um, the federal monies for rental assistance. And we had to go through with an eviction with this person. Um, and it, it was not a good situation. I also know that they got evicted out of the place they went to after our place already. And it's only been a matter of months since that happened. Um, so there, there are bad people, but there are lots and lots of good people you run into by meeting the people yourselves, if, if you have the time to do that. Um, as I said, it's something I would consider doing in the next couple of years, but um, there's a, it takes a lot of skill sets to do that, plus your regular job, if you work a regular job on top of everything else, like I do. Um, and, and to Mark's point, a Amy has sort of transitioned over the last couple of years to being our, our main property manager. And um, it, it's, it's worked out good for 24 years. As I said, it's, but I, I can definitely see a time where it's gonna change soon. Hey, Jeff, what's your policy on uh, pets in your units? And how do you dance, work out that uh, fine line? Cause yeah, so there's a fine line with that, that, right? It's, um, we have a rule for 24 years, we've had a rule for non-dangerous, non-destructive pets. I make a point of trying to meet um, all the dogs before people move in. And um, we, well, that, that was until Amy was, was doing the majority of the renting. Um, so non-dangerous and non-destructive is like not dangerous to the building, not destructive to the building, not dangerous to the tenants in the building. Um, and, and that's worked out great. Insurance companies are not, are, are have more specific guidelines. It's very breed specific, but anybody that's been around dogs before knows that it's more a matter of like bad pets are because of how they're trained and raised. It's not a matter of, it's not usually a matter of a specific breed. Um, and so that's, that's why I am willing to walk a, a, like a fine line between the insurance company and my tenants, because most animals are fine. Uh, we've rented to people the pit bulls. Um, yeah, for, for, well, there, one specific family I'm thinking of, they had a pit bull they rented to us from uh, like 1999 to 2018. I, I, I knew him for, you know, 18 something years. Never had a problem with that dog at all. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you for sharing. That's, that's yeah. great. You guys have yeah. more um, experience than the rest of us combined. Yeah, well, I was just I was just reflecting um, the place we had up in Rochester that we rehabbed. They um, the the people up there had a Rottweiler, and that's another breed that was on that list that insurance companies don't like. And we never had a problem with that one either. It was just a lovable like couch potato, for lack of a better word of describing it. As I said, most most dogs are not a problem when you if you get to meet them, and you and you can so you can screen them before they come in. You can screen them out you can see their behavior. And if they're aggressive to you, don't let them in. It's pretty simple and straightforward that way. All right, thanks for sharing. Uh, Constance, you're a um, landlord two buildings now. What's been your experience, particularly since you live in the building? That's different than the last two gentlemen. Is that better or worse, would you say? You know, I've never not I mean, I guess I don't live with the people at Central, but I used to. So, so I kind of um, was, I knew who my tenants were before I ran into them. And, and uh, the funny story about the building I currently live in is it came with three vacancies, one, one of which I took. But the, the second I posted on Facebook that my partner was under contract to buy it, I had multiple people messaging me looking for rentals. Um, so I had no problem renting the building out. I think we closed on July 10th and I had the two vacancies that I needed to fill filled um, by August 1st. I mean, it was no problem at all. And I've, I've had um, good success with the, the tenants that I have through word of mouth. I, I definitely, when I move, when I buy the next building, we'll have to have a more 
formal application process because I won't be owner occupied. So the New Hampshire um, uh, statues will will be and being a realtor, I need to make sure that there's not any um, possibility that somebody would accuse me of discriminating where I don't have that same pressure when I'm owner occupying the buildings because they're under four units. And since I technically own three and Waz owns four, um, neither of us have hit the place where we have to be more careful with, uh, with a formal screening process. And definitely in my plan to hire a property manager in the future, um, it is a lot of work. I, like I said earlier, I tell people when they're looking to buy their first home to consider a duplex or three unit or four unit, if you can find it. Um, because very likely in New Hampshire still, if you can find a four unit, you can have your entire mortgage covered by your tenants. Um, even with the, the, the cost having gone up significantly in the last few years, but um, which means when you move out, you'll have the, the, the leeway to hire a property manager. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a job. <laughs> like you're buying yourself a job. Like I, I've fixed toilets myself. Um, I try to hire people to do work for me, but it's not easy to find people to work right now either, uh, especially when you're looking at like a little odd job here and there. So the property managers have already have the established relationships with contractors to get the work done. So it's definitely um, something that I look forward to in the future because I would like I said I don't plan on selling. I want the cash flow through the mortgage just being paid off in retirement, but I don't want to work for the next 50 years. So um, it, I also would like to say like managing your own properties for their first so many years is a really good way to learn about the business. Uh, I've got a client who I helped buy multifamilies that definitely calls me asking for suggestions on what to do with, with their tenants and <clears throat> keep suggesting they put their property into property management um, if they don't actually plan on being a professional landlord forever. But um, their the, the learning curve is pretty steep, so. Well, there can be a lot of calls. Robert's on his call. Robert, if you'd like to share one of your horror stories with this, you're welcome to. He has a duplex in Nashua. It gets an unbelievable $2,000 a month rent because uh, it's a big unit. So that part is great, but you also get some shady people who just want to rent out each room. What's been your experience, Robert? Oh, yeah. Um, one correction. It's now 2000. 50 so up even more <laughs> yeah N nashua it's kind of amazing what you can get for rents but yeah um i guess well my entire landlording experience i've definitely seemed to have more difficulties than other people potentially possibly because of the location on ledge street which yeah well it's not the tree streets at least is what i say about it <laughs> um but I have never had a full lease go through for any tenant. They all, all in the case of the first tenant, um, stopped paying rent, thankfully, before COVID and left of their own volition. Um, then I then I had then I tried a, a roommate situation my next time, and that ended up in some dude assaulting their girlfriend and just causing a whole headache for me um trying to deal with that and the police um luckily you know again it ended amicably and basically me and the ten tenants coming to an agreement that basically they um paid out they paid me money until i found a new tenant and um basically broke the lease off at that point. Um, but I don't think that's, e despite all that, I don't even think that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I think the worst thing that happened to me, it was just right after I was buying it. And just the fact that um, 
I didn't know what to, I didn't know to do my entire due diligence and found a lot of surprises with this um, house, including, um, oh, within the first three months, there were fleas, there were bed bugs, there was foundation issue, there was foundation issues, not, minor foundation issues that went unnoticed. So I guess what I'm really taking out of this into my, ne my next unit is, well, you know, just to be more careful of things, the first, especially things you don't expect. Like I could, I would have never figured like after walking through that unit, like right before I closed on it, and um, like months prior that there would be a huge flea or be bed bug issue. I'd think that'd be something I'd notice, but apparently not. It makes me want to like just, I know I'm now in contract with um, monthly, qu well, quarterly pest inspections for um, my, my unit. And uh, probably mm -hmm. the next time I, bu I buy a unit, not not being part of the contract, maybe not being part of the contract, but just have him on his own time, take a quick look and see what happens. Cause I certainly don't want to be in that situation, spending up to $2,000 again, trying to get rid of pests right after I buy it. All right, well, thank you for sharing those uh, stories, Robert. Who was your realtor anyway? Who, what was wrong with him? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> uh, and of course, we had, he had a home inspection. We always tell you to get a home inspection, but you know the home inspector isn't going to look for bed bugs. And who knows when uh, people actually bring those in because that was a roommate situation. And Robert had a tough time of it. And he lives in the building. I don't know if he mentioned that or not, but he's owner occupied, and still his uh, tenants were right downstairs upstairs uh, downstairs and upstairs. we still pull all these shenanigans and have arguments and it was tough to get them out so even uh, yeah. even though you usually have better better results with tenants when you live there it's not always the case so i'm glad yeah. you're i guess that's still enough friends i'm glad we're still friends and you're still thinking about another one we'll just be more <laughs> uh, more cautious it, <laughs> yeah no i guess that's one thing i should really po point out um you know it's one thing if you have tenants not paying rent in a remote building. It's another thing when your tenants aren't paying rent and they live right downstairs of just the anger and frustration when probably you hear them downstairs, like having a good time and stuff. And it's like, oh, they're also not paying rent. So um, it's really another thing on you mentally. <laughs> I think that's a great point because um, you – if you are an investor, this is your income and your your livelihood. Your and you're investing in yourself, and your tenants aren't going to care that much about your property. They might care about their home enough that they, you know, line up their shoes, hang up their coats. But overall, it's it's not theirs. So you have to have a a, a level of detachment to your own things. Like I've leased it, I'll get it back, you know. And and if you're if you're too involved, you'll just drive yourself crazy. Let's, thanks, thanks for sharing, guys. Let's talk a little bit about the numbers when analyzing property. When you're, are you guys used to buying a single family house, you just look at comps to know if you're in the ballpark. Of course, in this market, it's not even good enough then. You have to bid 10% over what the comps say. But when you look at a multifamily property, uh, a good investor will look at a number of metrics, yeah, including cash on cash return, total ROI, uh, something called a uh, cap rate. And I thought we'd just run through a quick analysis on a property and I'll give you my thoughts and maybe uh, some of the other landlord investors on the call can give their thoughts. By the way, cap rate stands for capitalization rate and that refers to, um, it, it's, it's used generically across all types of investment properties to give you an idea of what the return on investment is if you were to buy the house cash. So if you buy a duplex for $300,000, uh, your expenses are, are um, I'm sorry, your rents are 
$30,000 a year, your expenses are $15,000 a year, your uh, net income is $15,000 a year, you divide that into the uh, $300,000 purchase price, that's a cap rate of 5%. And people, big investors look at that because they're comparing if they have $300,000 cash, if they put it in stocks or bonds and have no landlord issues, no repairs, no nothing, you know, what kind of sort of re return can they make? Let's look at a property. I'm gonna change my screen here. Bear with me. So you guys can see sort of a standard analysis of what people look for. Okay. Screen share. Okay, this is an investment profile on the on the screen share. This is a flyer that was included in the listing of this particular property in Manchester, New Hampshire. List price three forty five. Um, in this profile, he's he's assuming a twenty five percent down payment. That means you're an investor. You're not living there. Obviously, if you were owner occupied, you could do 5%, 10%, or maybe something different. But in this example, he's, the listing agent is assuming uh, an investor. And this one has four units. Uh, you can see that down there on the property income 800 a month, 795 a month, 825 a month, and 725 a month. Those are low rents in, in Manchester, so they must be one bedrooms. And I do believe this is a four unit, one bedroom each apartment building in Manchester, corner of Auburn and Belmont. And Jeff knows exactly where that is. <laughs> he used to have a place on Auburn Street and then um, Constance knows where that is, it's two blocks from her places. But what we see here, just to give you an example of a sort of a typical property in Manchester or Concord or even Nashua, is that the expenses compared to the income are often um, about half. They're typically 45, 40, 45, 50% of your monthly income will be your monthly expenses. And that's before debt. Now this particular um, calculation He's showing the mortgage on there, the debt of 13,943. And the numbers here aren't quite accurate and they don't need to be. I just want you, you to get a feel for the things you have to look at. He's putting the mortgage in there of uh, 13,943 a year, which is just a little over $1,000 a month. But he's, if you look down at the bottom under his assumptions, I'm sorry, look above there. And the investment profile is based on the following mortgage calculation, which is 75% loan to value at three and a half percent for 30 years. Well, I, I don't think you can get that right now as an investor. You're probably closer to 4%, maybe four and a quarter. So his example of 1162 a month is a, is a little light, but it's okay, because what we would do is you plug all these numbers into your own spreadsheet on every property, and then uh, determine if this is, on first blush, worth your consideration. And look at the very bottom. He shows, with the down payment, 25%, and the total net income is about 18% annual ROI, which, which isn't bad, I suppose, but you know, what, once you work with your agent when identifying properties, you're gonna look at all the other things like deferred expenses, deferred maintenance, what needs to be done to, uh, does it need a new roof, that sort of thing. Um, hey, Frank, when you're looking at properties, what kind of metrics do you like to compare between properties? Is it cap rate? Is it cash on cash return? Give us a feel for it. And then Jeff, yeah. I'd like to hear the same from you. Um, I, I mostly use cash flow because I want to be able to get a paycheck 
each month for my properties. Uh, one thing I noticed that's missing there, unless I'm, it's on my small screen, I don't see any costs associated with uh, vacancies or capital expenses. Correct, or, or property management. Or property management, right. So I think that's a little bit on the high side for that property. Um, just for example, on my last property, I did a 30% down 20 year loan. So, you know, my mortgage is uh, quite a bit higher than that. And I was still able to get a decent return on my property. Uh, I, I make sure as far as my properties, I want to have as big of a building as possible because I feel that that, you know, mitigates any kind of vacancies. Uh, I know one of the other callers was talking about having problems with bed bugs and repairs and things like that. And if you have my last building is seven units, you know, if I have a problem with one of the tenants, I can survive with no problems. I still have cash flow coming in at the end of the month, although it's reduced because I have the other six tenants paying. Um, one of the, the other big things for me is always to try to buy in the city limits because I want to make sure that the properties have municipal garbage pickup and also uh, natural gas because that saves quite a bit of money. Usually tenants that I've dealt with are always looking for natural gas over electric and the heating because uh, it's, you know, it's much less expensive. That's a real good point about um, the, the city services because when we look at properties, you guys have to look carefully at if the utilities are split or not. Uh, ideally, in a three or four unit building, it actually doesn't, doesn't matter, whatever number of you, units you have, you want the tenants to all be paying their own heat, their own hot water, and their own electric bills. Almost everywhere, the landlord will pay the water and sewer, and that's okay. But you're looking for separate utilities wherever you can get them. Because if, if in some of these old buildings, for example, you have one boiler for all three units, so you're paying the heat for all the tenants. Now, certainly you will include that in the rent. The rent will be 75 or $100 a month more than comparable units without it. But, you know, they're leaving their windows open in the middle of the winter while you're paying for heat because they just don't care. So separate utilities are important. Off-street parking is super important in Manchester, Concord, and Nashua in these, in these uh, congested cities. Um, what other, Jeff, what other things do you look for when comparing uh, properties? Well, we learned a lesson buying the place up in Penacook um, because they messed up the insurance. Uh, what the um, previous owner was paying for insurance, they didn't include everything on it. So, I mean, insurance is a big one for us that we look at. Uh, where we do the property management ourselves, you know, we, we don't care what they were paying for that prior. Um, we, we look for places that are more on the efficient side as far as like how much the utilities cost the tenant, uh, because that is a factor with their, with their choice on if they want to rent from you. Um, yeah, th th things like that, you kind of learn along the way what, like what works for tenants. Um, the lower you keep the utilities, like the more fuel efficient the unit is, um, the more, the easier it will be to get it filled, for instance. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yep. With, we had a, we had a um, question in the chat room about how much would you expect to pay to purchase a similar property in the current market? Uh, well, that one that I just showed you the, the numbers for, that is current, actually current in, in uh, Manchester. And I think it was listed at uh, 450. So well, what we're seeing now, and uh, I'd love to hear Constance chime in on this, is that um, we're seeing about $100,000 a door. Five, six years ago, we were seeing $40,000, $50,000 a door. Uh, in Manchester, three, four units, if they're like two to three bedrooms each, you're looking at uh, over $100,000 to $125,000 per unit. Nashville is a little bit higher, but rents are higher. Concord, a little bit higher than Manchester, rents are a little bit higher. 
unless you're in Penacook, where Jeff and uh, Frank have, have buildings in Penacook, uh, you don't quite get the rates. Uh, that's a, by the way, that's a northern suburb of, Man of Concord. Concord. Your taxes are a lot higher there. It's a little bit farther out, so you don't get the rents. But um, oh. I hope, hope that answers your question, Shane. I know it's, it's, it's hard to say because we have to look at a lot of properties. Also, it depends on whether utilities are separated, if there's off-street parking, you know, who's, who's paying for the heat and stuff like that. Uh, how old is the roof? How old is the building? Um, what kind of deferred maintenance or repairs it needs? These are all factors. But Constance can, can tell us firsthand uh, experience. Just last week, she put a bid on a building. How much was that? And, and it went for over asking price, I believe. Yeah, it must have gone for over asking um, unless they had cash. I, it hasn't closed yet, as far as I know. I could I could check. Um, it was a uh, very average condition, three, no, they were three or four bedrooms, one bath, laundry in the units. Um, they didn't have lead safe certificates and the list price was 420 or 419 and I, I can't, I think I went a little above it. I was willing to escalate above it. Um, so that's, they're pretty big units and their, their rents were under the market rent. I actually, um, I have a better example, one I wasn't involved in. I uh, met somebody recently who is a tenant who pays 1100 for a three to four bedroom, third floor walk up, um, if anybody's familiar with Manchester, it's over by Pine Street, worst neighborhood than I live in. The The building was just bought by an FHA buyer, and I was looking it up for her because um, she's like, oh, you know, the downstairs tenant had been here for, you know, 30 plus years, and they kicked him out after they bought it. So I looked it up, and it was an FHA. Uh, it was paid, they paid 450 for it. And I was like, they're definitely going to kick you out or raise your rent. Like there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Um, Cause they had given the second floor notice and the first floor they're currently working on renovating. So she messaged me today and said that she, they told her they want her to move to the second floor after they're done renovating it. And her new rent will be 18 a month. Um, so she, she can't afford that. And uh, I'm not sure how that'll pan out, but I even I think that's a little pushing it for that neighborhood um, for a, a, a three to four bedroom. But the Section 8 rents for a four bedroom in Manchester right now are a little over 17 a month. So that's why I think they're, they're pushing it to get that rent from her. But that gives you an idea like how fast the rents have come up so therefore the the values of the buildings are also like i i wouldn't even want to own in that neighborhood and somebody paid 450 for a three unit there so yeah the rents have really got insane and for those of you who are new to the, the market here uh, occupancy rates are very high in new hampshire southern new hampshire we're talking 98 99 percent occupancy so it's easy to raise rents and it's also a little bit easier to to really um, get a good quality tenant you need to screen them well but you have a lot of choices um, Amy we had a question about short-term rentals so maybe you can uh, let us know what that was but let me insert that a, another client of mine is buying duplexes in Concord not and he doesn't like the idea of long-term leases he uh, instead prefers to do Airbnb, and if he he said if he this duplex, two units were three bedrooms each, he could rent them out for fifteen hundred a month, so it's three thousand a month. But in Airbnb, he's earning five thousand a month on that building, with an, an occupancy rate you know Air, of Airbnb of about eighty percent. So. It's, a, it's one uh, angle that's uh, new nowadays that we wouldn't have been talking about five years ago. And so short-term rentals is certain, certainly something we can help you with. You just have to be careful on which town it's in because some of the towns are starting to push back. So Amy, what's the question about for that? Um, yeah, so we just had someone asking about short-term rentals and um, 
non-traditional kind of long-term rental buildings. So like what are some options for short-term rentals that are out of the box and not necessarily cookie cutter? Yeah, uh, you could do like a tiny home, for example, or a ur uh, rural experience. I even have heard of a yurt. I know a guy has a yurt in the middle of the woods um, that he rents out of Airbnb. And it sounds ridiculous, but in, in the good weather, you can get um, 80, $90 a night for a tent in effect. So if you're creative, I think there are some good opportunities out there as long as you're a, a hands-on manager. Anybody else here has done short-term rentals? Uh, I'm on a- uh, I, I've done room rentals. Like I have somebody currently renting one, one bedroom out of a roommate situation and they're only planning on staying for a couple months and then moving on. So, um, all utilities included, I definitely get more rent with multiple roommates. It's a four bedroom um, unit than even covering their utilities than I would have had I just rented it. I mean, maybe not if I could have gotten 18 for it, but um, it's uh, it's it's worked out well um, to give people a place to land in Manchester to have that as well. I think that's great. Everybody on this call is with the Free State Project, either directly or indirectly. And uh, it's nice as part of our mission of liberty in our lifetime to help people move to New Hampshire, to maybe have some of these units where we can help people land like a, a Liberty hostel, um, short-term roommate situations. I remember when I moved to New Hampshire, 2007, I, uh, I only had a week here and I had to find a place to rent, I rented a room in North End Manchester. I was fortunate to find some, uh, a guy at a really nice house, rented it out. He didn't know me from Adam, but you know, it's, it's a great landing pad. So maybe we do that as part of our civic duty, our community service to our, our Liberty community. Well, we're, we wanna wrap up. We've already uh, been on this an hour. Uh, Amy and Constance can maybe give us an update on some of the um, upcoming seminars in case you more guys want to, uh, attend those. We do thank you for being on tonight. This will be recorded if you have, if you want to see it or share with a friend and certainly uh, contact any of us at Porcupine Real Estate if you have some follow-up questions. Amy, can you give us the lowdown on the next two seminars? Yep. Um, next Monday, uh, the 26th at 6 p.m., we're doing a home buying seminar. And then the following week on the 2nd, Constance is doing, um, can I still buy a house in New Hampshire in a seller's market? That's great. Visit our Facebook page for details on those. Uh, we thank the panelists very much for being on tonight. And even more than that, we appreciate you guys who are... Uh, signed up to the webinar and had asked some really good questions and um, are interested and please let us know how we can help. So, thanks everybody.